Well, hey, PV Church, Pastor Jeff here. Really hope you're doing well. I wanna thank you for engaging with us during this time, for staying in touch with other people in our church family, for continuing to give, for continuing to serve, and really wanna encourage you, don't waste this time. God is in control. He knew this was coming. He knew you would be exactly where you are. And so we want to encourage you to focus on your relationship with Jesus through through reading your Bible, opening the scriptures, through prayer, through fasting. Uh, focus on your relationship with your spouse. We are putting out something through our newsletter and we're focusing on uh, Lisa and Francis Chan's book, You and Me Forever. So take a look at that. Subscribe to our newsletter if you aren't already. Um, continue to disciple your kids, teaching them about Jesus, uh, teaching them about everyday life, right? This is just a great time to teach your kids about some of the uh, the things that you've got to deal with as an adult. Grow them up, mature them up, teach them about that stuff. Uh, continue to love your neighbors, the people that you are networking with, uh, the people that you relate to kind of through everyday life. Um, make sure you're continuing to love them, stay in touch with them. And then as restrictions get lifted, let me just say, uh, we're, we're going to be asking you to consider, um, as the province allows, opening up your circle. And um, even though we may not be able to gather together as a church family for a little while yet, um, we're going to ask you to start to gather around the scriptures as, you know, uh, families or opening up your circle to other people as the province allows and to gather around the scriptures um, to pray together, to talk about mission together. And uh, we hope that some of those restrictions start to get lifted not long after the long weekend. And on that note, just want to wish you a fantastic May long weekend. Hope you get to enjoy some of the beautiful uh, areas around the Okanagan on this May long weekend. All right, so grab your Bible, open up to Acts chapter 2, 22 to 36 is where we're at this morning. And what we find is the early church is in Jerusalem. As promised Jesus, he had sent the Holy Spirit. He had given the church this unbelievable, crazy, huge mission to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the end of the earth. And then what we see is the Holy Spirit empowers the church to participate in God's mission, to go out into the city and begin declaring the mighty works of God. And what they do is they begin telling everyone about Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven in language that all these people gathered in Jerusalem could actually understand. Now, that was confusing to some people because here the early church, they were made up of the majority of their like simple Galileans and people began to wonder, wait a second, uh, they're kind of like, you know, redneck backcountry kind of folk. How do they know all these different languages? How is it that we are hearing them declare to us the mighty works of God in language that a whole bunch of us, um, you know, speak in? So what Peter ends up doing is he gets up to preach and to explain and give some context to what he believes is happening on this day as they celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem. And he begins his sermon, and what he shows is that what God had spoken through the prophet Joel over 800 years before was now actually being fulfilled. That what Joel prophesied about the Spirit being sent and sons and daughters, young and old, men and women, prophesying, proclaiming, what he means, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, uh, was now being fulfilled. That in God's redemptive plan for history, this was a unique moment that God was pouring out the Holy Spirit on all his people. Right, so many people, they, they, when they get to Pentecost and, and the early church in the book of Acts, they focus on this idea of, oh, they spoke in tongues, they spoke in all these different languages. But really, I think what, what we should be focusing on, what we should be completely blown away by, is that the Holy Spirit was now being poured out on all of God's people. It wasn't just the prophets. It wasn't just the priests. It wasn't now just something reserved for kings. That God's presence was just, wasn't just was simply uh, relegated to, to the Holy of Holies in the temple. Now the Spirit came down and divided as of tongues on fire on all of God's people on the early church. So that means that all of God's people are chosen. All of God's people are sent. Right. This is why Peter could write in 1 Peter 2.9 in his later letter, he could say this, he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Here's what Peter's saying. 
He's like, God is saving for himself a family and God's spirit will rest on all people in all of God's family, not just on the head of that family, not just on the prophets, not just on the priests, not just on the kings, not just in the temple, but you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. He fills you. He empowers you. Why? To go and to do this unbelievable mission that God has given his church to do. So here's Peter. He's in front of thousands of people at this point in the city of Jerusalem, and he has their attention. Everyone's wondering, what is going on here? And Peter sets the stage. He's like, you guys know your scriptures. Here's what the prophet Joel prophesied. Here's what God said to him. And here's what is happening on this day. Let me further explain it. So Peter's got their attention, the attention of thousands of people. And the question is, what will he focus on? So let me ask you, if you were Peter and you had the attention of thousands of people, right? Put it into our context. You, you, you get your YouTube channel. You've got thousands of subscribers. What are you going to talk about? Would it be politics? Would it be money? Would it be health? Would it be morality? Would it be the environment? Would it be like, oh, conspiracy theories, right? Would it be all of that stuff? Um, a little while ago, uh, before this whole pandemic hit, uh, we had done a gospel fluency workshop. And one of the realities that we learned in there is that we talk about what we love, right? In Luke 6, 45, Jesus says, it's out of the abundance of your heart that your mouth speaks. Do you remember when you first met your spouse? Do you remember when, when, you know, maybe when you first started dating and uh, like she was all you could talk about, right, guys? It's like you, you talked about her so much, your family just got sick and tired of like, shut up, talk about something else, man, right? Or, or, or ladies, when you first met, uh, you first started dating your, your now husband, that's all you could talk to your girlfriends about, right? Why? Because they captured your heart. They captured your affection. You talk about what you love. You talk about what fills your heart and what captures your affections, right? It's why we talk about great restaurants. It's why we talk about good coffee. It's why we talk about, you know, those of you who love thrifting, your favorite thrift store. You talk about your vacations. And if social media is any indicator, a bunch of you are just filled with conspiracy theories. You love that, right? Because that's all you talk about, which you shouldn't. Um, and so we, we talk about what we love. It's one of the things we learned in our uh, Gospel Fluency Workshop. But we also talk about what works. So a bunch of you, right? You, you do keto. You, you do your multi-level marketing thing, sideways triangle. It's not triangles, it's a sideways triangle. Um, you talk about CrossFit. You talk about what you love and you talk about what works. So here's what we're going to do before we get to uh, looking at what Peter talks about, what he loves, what fills his affection, um, before looking at the rest of Peter's sermon, what I want to do is I want to hand it over to you. I want to give this, uh, uh, hand this back to you, and and I want you to ask the question with whoever it is that you're gathered with, your family, your kids, your spouse, your friends, what do you talk about the most? I want you to answer that question. But here's the thing, I don't want you to answer it. I want the person beside you to tell everyone else in the room what they hear you talking about the most. All right. So does that make sense? Here's the deal. You can't get mad at their answer. You can't be like, that's not what I talk about. It's what everyone else hears. So it's obviously what you talk about. And then what I want you to do is um, once you've kind of had some fun, go around the room, do that. I want you to read Acts chapter 2, 22 to 36. And then I want you to go through the four questions, all right? So we've been doing this for several weeks now. You can find, uh, I'll put a link in the description below and ask those questions as you read through the text, talk about it, take about 15 minutes uh, to work through that as a family. And, uh, and then I'll catch you up on the other side of that and we'll work through uh, Peter's sermon together. We'll see you in a little bit. All right, well, welcome back. How did that go? Um, did you learn something about the things that consume most of, of your speech? What do you talk about the most? What did your family say? Were they like, dad, you're always talking about sports or your mom, you're always talking about whatever work or celebrity or something. Um, maybe, maybe your kids like, can we please just stop talking about Corona? Uh, maybe you are super tired of the negative news. I don't know if you've caught on to what John Krasinski from The Office has been doing. 
he, he has something going on YouTube called Some Good News, SGN. And if that's any indication by the millions of people that have subscribed to that and watched that on a weekly basis, we are so tired of talking about bad news. We just want some good news. Now, here's the thing. Do you know what gospel literally means? It means good news. See, church, we have the best news to share with people. So if there's anything that should be consuming the things that we talk about, it should be the good news of Jesus Christ. So go back to what we talked about before, um, this reality, this principle that uh, we talk about what we love. So if, if you find that you, you what, what doesn't consume a lot of your conversation, if you're like, I talk about a lot of things, I don't talk about Jesus, well, then it kind of begs the question, how's your love for Jesus? And I don't say that to like heap a bunch of shame on you and make you feel guilty. Um, but here's another thing that you're going to find is that you, you actually begin to love what you talk about. And so what would happen if you just actually started to talk about Jesus more? Like a lot of us, we've been married for, for several years. Um, my wife and I, we're, we're heading into 20 years of marriage this year. And um, maybe you've experienced this in marriage where, where, where you kind of take your spouse for granted. You begin to forget some of the some of the really wonderful things about them, right? And you don't invest in your relationship. You uh, you don't talk about how wonderful your spouse is. And what ends up happening is you you st- tend to drift from them, right? You you drift from what you love. And so one of the ways kind of back is to just start talking about what's so amazing about your spouse. And what you're going to find is that the more you talk about them, the more you're going to actually find that. You feel love towards them is that is that your love for them will begin to to grow a bit and that would be my encouragement um, in terms of the good news that we have to share with jesus if the gospel doesn't consume a lot of what you talk about um and, and if you're like man i just i feel like i've drifted from my love for jesus my encouragement would be just start talking about jesus more talk about all the amazing things that he saved you from talk about the amazing things that he's done to actually save you and i think what you'll start to find is that you're gonna to begin to love once again what you talk about. So start talking about Jesus, start talking about how amazing he is. And what you're gonna find here, um, you know, as hopefully you saw this as you went through Acts 2, uh, those few verses, is that that's where Peter lands, that's what he's consumed with, that's where that's where his affections lie, is in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so he begins to talk about them, right? So um, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. He says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Now, I'm not sure if this tension came up in your discussion, but Peter holds to two truths that doesn't seem that they don't seem to bother him like they bother us. The first truth that Peter holds to is that God is sovereign. And we see this in, in the life of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the God man. He is sent by God the Father. God the Father attested, he approved uh, of Jesus and his, his life, his death and his resurrection. Jesus came in God's authority and God did many mighty works through Jesus, many wonders, many signs. Jesus was always God's plan for our redemption. That before all of history began, God knew God had a plan that Jesus would be crucified, that Jesus would be killed to atone for our sins. That Jesus would always be the one, he'd be the Messiah who had come to save people from their sins. He'd be the sacrificial lamb. Now, at the same time that Peter holds to to God's sovereignty, the same time he holds to this truth that, okay, but God is not the author of sin, that man is still responsible, right? So, so when Peter preaches and he's talking about the good news of Jesus, who does Peter hold responsible for killing Jesus? He's like, he looks at the Israelites, he looks at these thousands of people gathered, he's like, this is on you. You rejected Jesus. You had him crucified by the Romans. And so Paul, or Peter, sorry, he holds these two truths um, in tension. He holds them both to be true at the same time, that God is sovereign, but man is responsible for their sin. 
So on the one hand, and in terms of God's sovereignty, God is not surprised by the fact that we sinned. He's not surprised that he had to like, he wasn't like, oh no, now now humanity's gone wrong and now I got to send my son. Oh, I wish there would have been something different, but this is all I got. He's not surprised by any of that. But at the same time, God is sovereign. He's always had this plan for our redemption. But at the same time, what we know to be true in the Bible is that sin brings death. And the good news of Jesus is that he was the one who came to pay the penalty for our sin. That our sin was our responsibility. That God held us responsible for uh, for our sin. And so me and you, because we were born sinners, um, we had a part in Jesus' death. It was our sin that was nailed to the cross with Christ. But what does God do? He sends his son to live a sinless life. He sends his son to be the perfect, uh, sinless sacrifice on our behalf to pay the penalty that we could not pay, that God ultimately held us responsible for. Jesus is like, God, I'm going to take their sin. I'm going to carry it to the cross. I'm going to pay the penalty that is due for their sin. And so what does God do? He looks at Jesus' perfect sacrifice and he raises Jesus from the dead. Death could not hold Jesus Christ. Jesus was too pure. The spirit was too powerful. And so what Peter does is he reaches back to the writings of King David and he shows how the resurrection is such good news. And he shows how that's a part of God's plan. It's a part of God's sovereignty. It's a part of what God has done to give us hope. And so you read the next few verses, um, Acts 2, 25 through 28. He says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One seek corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So here's what Peter's doing. He's looking all the way back to King David. And what he is saying is he's saying that the the hope that he's experiencing now because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because of the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of the Father, because of the sending of the Holy Spirit, Peter's looking at this and he's like, listen, this is such good news and it gives me such great hope. And it's the same hope that King David had. See, King David, he looked at death and he's like, ah, there's something so wrong about that. But there was something in King David that he wrote about in, he's referencing Psalm 16 here. He's quoting Psalm 16, that David had this hope that one day God would send a Messiah. He would send someone who would be a part of his kingdom, a part of his lineage that would fix this, that would remedy this whole death thing and sin thing. And so Peter stands and he quotes David like he quoted Joel. And he's like, no, this is the fulfillment. Jesus is a fulfillment of what King David had promised, of what he had prophesied about. And what Peter does is he stands up in front of the crowd and, and man, he is such a changed man, right? Like you think about it. Do you remember, do you remember at Jesus trial, Peter's there and Jesus is being tried and it's just this crazy kangaroo court, uh, totally unjust. And as soon as someone recognizes Peter, what does he do? He denies Jesus and he runs from the crowd. But now here you have Peter armed with the reality of Jesus' resurrection, with the good news of Jesus, with the Jesus that he loves, that he has affection for. Uh, And here's Peter, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? Does he run from the crowd? No, he stands in front of thousands of people and he's like, let me tell you, the good news that is found in Jesus Christ. And he points all the way back to the patriarch David, to their King David. He's like, this is the hope that King David had. And because King David had this hope of a future king, man, he could not be shaken. His heart was glad. His tongue rejoiced. And so Peter's like, and so I want to, I want to tell you about this Jesus. I want to tell you about this good news, this resurrection, this king that overcame death itself. And so Peter goes on, verses 29 through 35. It's a larger chunk, but let me read the whole thing for you. He says, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about patriarch, about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, 
he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh seek corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, one of the things that I want you to remember here, kind of as we read these passages, and and by the way, like we, we could literally spend weeks and weeks and weeks on, on, on these few passages alone, looking at all of the promises that were made to King David and uh, the promises that God said, like there, there's going to be a, you know, from your lineage, there will be a king who will be a forever king. There will be a kingdom that will be a forever kingdom. And those were the promises that all of the people that Peter was speaking to, they held on to. I mean, they they looked at their King David uh, and and. I mean, he was one of the most important figures in their nation's history, right? And so Peter stands up and he's like, like, I understand that. He's like, I, I get what you guys think about King David. But, but what King David said is that there is someone whom he will worship. There is someone that he as a king will bow down to. There will be a greater king than me, right? And so what Peter does is he highlights some of the differences between King David and this greater King Jesus. And what's one of the main differences that Peter highlights between David and Jesus? Well, just to be frank, David died. Right? And, and, and they, took his, they took his bones and they carried them in an ossuary and they, they had a tomb for King David. And Peter even says, like, hey, you can, you can go and visit his tomb. And in fact, many of us do. Right? We go and we remember the promises that made. We, we long for this coming king who will be a forever king. We long for a forever kind of kingdom. And what Peter does is he stands in front of these thousands of Israelites. And he says, Jesus is that king. This is the one, he is the one that David longed for. He's the one that, uh, he, he's the one that's the fulfillment of all those promises and, and the prophecies even that David made, right? So Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And unlike David, Jesus was physically resurrected. God raised him up. And then Peter's like, and you all saw it. Like it was like two weeks ago. He's like, it was 10 days ago that he ascended. You all heard his teaching. You saw him eat. You went to him in the temple courts. You saw him walking around. You know he was raised from the grave. You saw him crucified. You saw his body. You saw the guards. And then you saw him resurrected. God exalted this Jesus. And when God exalted him, he, he, he brought him up to sit at the right hand of the Father. This is the king who rules and reigns. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, as Joel promised so many years ago. And here's what Peter's doing. He's setting before the Israelites an opportunity to respond to the work of God in Jesus Christ. Here's what he's doing. He's calling them to action. It's like you have to do something with the resurrected, exalted, ascended Jesus. You have to do something with this Christ. And what Peter stands before them with is with absolute confidence that Jesus is the one that King David spoke about. He is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings who has come to usher in the kingdom of God. Listen to the certainty. Verse 36. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so Peter stands before all of these Israelites, thousands of people who have seen Jesus. They saw his life. They saw his death. They were witnesses of his resurrection. And they saw him for 40 days after his resurrection, before he ascended, hearing him teach, watching him eat, seeing him in the temple courts, all of that stuff. And so now Peter, he gets up and he preaches and he goes all the way back to Joel and he goes back to two different Psalms that David wrote. He's like, listen, this is the one that they were talking about. This is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the King of Kings whose kingdom will never end. He overcame death. Death cannot bring this to end anymore because he conquered death. Jesus is the good news. And so the question to the, that Peter puts to the Israelites to consider is this. Do you know for certain that Jesus came to be both Lord and Savior of your life? 
Are you certain that Jesus is the good news, that he came to pay the penalty for your sins to set you free, that you can be certain that he's given you a new identity, he's given you a new family, a new purpose for living, that you can be certain to live under his rule and his reign for God's glory, that you can be certain of this new mission of taking the good news to your family, to your city and out into the world, that you can be certain of this new power through the person and work of the Holy Spirit to live a new life. Are you certain that Jesus came to be both Lord and Savior of your life? And so if today that's something that God has revealed to you, of your need for Jesus to be saved from your own sin, well, then we would call you to respond to that. We would call you to confess your sin, to confess your need for Christ, to confess uh, the reality that, um, that you are responsible for your own sin, and then to turn to understand that God had a definite plan in Jesus Christ for your salvation and to turn from your sin and to receive forgiveness from Christ. And so if, if you've responded in that way today, then we would love to hear from you. So would you contact us? There's a link in the description. Um, we would love to, to pray with you, to correspond with you, to help you get connected, like wherever you are in this world, to help you get connected into a local church. Uh, so that you could come come under the authority of, of a local church, be baptized into this new identity, uh, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that you are adopted, that you've been purchased, and that you are the sent, uh, part of the sent people of God, that you would receive the Holy Spirit to live a new life, a new power, on a new mission. And so church, may all of our hearts be filled, like Peter's was, with affection for Jesus, and may it result in us being a people who talk often about Jesus, who talk about the one that we love, the one who is both our Lord and our Savior. Church, we have good news, and it's the good news of Jesus Christ. I love you, church. Have a fantastic May long weekend.